Grace, mercy, and peace to each of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and good morning. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome everybody, especially if you're visiting with us. It's so good to have a full church on Easter. It's great to see everybody, and we would love to tell you more about our church if you would like to know. I'll be outside after the service today. I'd love to shake the hands of everybody, wish you a happy Easter, and, and talk to everybody today. A couple of announcements as we get started. I want to say a special thanks to all who have made Holy Week special, to our Tenebrae readers on Friday, all of our musicians, our choir members who have been working so hard, to Laura and Susan for the Easter egg hunt yesterday. By the way, if you find an egg somewhere in your queue, it's all yours. There's candy inside. It's been a wonderful Holy Week, but we've already found one. We will have a congregational meeting next Sunday for the purpose of electing an elder to fill a vacant slot, so all of our members are invited to plan to stay next week after worship. I want to say thanks for, to all who have donated our lilies in honor or memory of someone. And our sanctuary looks beautiful for Easter Day, and we're grateful for that. And those are the announcements that I have. I think Chrissy has one. We had a request to do a new directory that has um, pictures. Thank you. 
worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our hymn of praise is number 123. There we 
make a we'll make it work. Awesome. All right. So this might be hard to see, so I'm gonna try to hold it up in the light. What do you guys see that I brought? Up? Okay. Let's keep going a little bit further. It's a blue glass. All right. Is the water all the way to the tip top? No. Okay. Okay, it's about halfway, right? Would you say this is about halfway full? Or would you say this is about halfway empty? Halfway full. Okay. So we can look at it two different ways, right? Some may look at this glass and say it is halfway full of water. And others may look at this glass and say, you know what? It's halfway gone. It's halfway empty. So we have different reactions to different things in life. So today we're celebrating what today? We're celebrating Easter. And the story of Easter morning, when they discovered that the tomb was empty, there were three different people that experienced it. And guess what? All three of them had different reactions. So the first one peeked inside the tomb and noticed that there were white linen, white cloth, and his name was Peter. And Peter noticed that the cloth were perfectly folded and laid where Jesus had been found. The second person peeked in and decided she didn't want to go. Her name was Mary. And she was overwhelmed with sadness because Jesus' body was gone. It was gone. It was missing to her. Yeah, it just went poof. Just went poof. Yeah, and the that. third person was John. And John looked in the tomb and he believed. He believed that Jesus did what he said he was going to do. He was going to rise again. So as we celebrate the Easter holiday, we've got two lessons. Let's do life lesson first. Life lesson for today is people have different reactions to different things, okay? They were at the same place, the same time, saw the same things, but yet all three of them reacted differently. One was curious, one was sad, and one believed. So as you come across things in life, it's okay if people have different reactions to them. That's okay. Lesson for today is we want to be those that believe. Are we believers today on Easter Sunday? Good. Because that gives us something to really celebrate. Can you hold your hands? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we look into an empty tomb. We look and we believe. May today bring hope that the story does not end with his death, but that we indeed serve a risen Savior. And all God's children say, sing together our hymn of preparation number 108. Please.
Could you please be seated? As we prepare our hearts and our minds to read Holy Scripture on this holy day, I invite you to pray with me for illumination. God, thank you for this day, for another Easter day. For many of us, we have celebrated all of our lives this day, and yet there is a freshness and a newness each time we gather for Easter. We pray that you would bless us again this day with your Holy Spirit. May it make the words we share together live again, just as Jesus does today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To join me in our responsive reading in Psalm 118, it's printed in your bulletin. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, and the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. As the son of the village rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. 
Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. So one Easter Sunday morning, a Sunday school teacher asked her class about the meaning of Easter. And one pupil said, well, Easter is when all the family gets together and they have a big turkey and they sing about the pilgrims and all of that. And the teacher said, no, that's not it. A second said, I know, Easter is when you get that big pine tree and you cover it with decorations and exchange gifts and sing lots of songs. And again, the teacher said, no, that's not it. <clears throat> then came the third pupil. And he began, Easter is when Jesus was killed, put in a tomb, and left for three days. And the teacher was ecstatic. He knows, he knows, she said. The boy continued, and then everybody gathers at the tomb and waits to see if Jesus comes out, and if he sees his shadow, <laughs> and that was the day the church had to find another Sunday school teacher. <laughs> so here are some famous last words. You're fired. You're bankrupt. The divorce is now final. It's incurable. There's nothing else the doctors can do. You failed your last chance. He died. These are the last words most of us hope we'll never have to hear. They're just words, and yet for many of us, they are words loaded with distress and suffering and fear. It's precisely why we hope never to hear them. If we've lived very much life at all, we know that at least one or two of these last words will come our way. Some of us have already had to hear them. There's a sense of permanence and finality about these words. Of course, that's why I've identified them as last words. There's no easy way back from them. There is only facing the cold, hard reality that everything is different now because we have had to hear them. These words are that blank stare out the window on a dreary, rainy morning kind of reality. And these are the very words the disciples of Jesus heard on Friday. Those that loved him the most were told, or perhaps they witnessed it themselves. He died. Jesus died. It wasn't a pretend death or a mystical one. In the first couple of centuries of the church, there were lots of ideas suggested trying to explain what had happened. Like, maybe Jesus, who was God incarnated, didn't really die, but just went away for a while. Or maybe Jesus went to sleep. Or just the, the human part died while the divine part continued. One, children, one child in the Easter egg hunt yesterday said, well, Jesus can't die. But that's not true. All of these have been declared by the church to be heresy, by the way, leaving only the words, Jesus died. All of Jesus died on the cross. At Calvary. I imagine that those that loved him must have wondered how something like this could have happened. Jesus was the one they were waiting for, for generations. He was the chosen one, right? The permanence and finality of Friday's last words must have been crushing. He died. It had to be that hard dose of reality like none other they've ever experienced. In fact, it's a little surprising, really, that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to the tomb when the Sabbath is over. We aren't sure why. Matthew's Gospel doesn't tell us that they went to anoint the body. Mark and Luke say that. But in our lesson, the women simply go to see the tomb. Perhaps for them, it's still that cold, dreary morning, blank stare. They simply cannot believe the last words. It just can't be that Jesus died and all is lost. When all of a sudden the angel literally comes with a rumble and a flash. There's an earthquake reminding us of Elijah over the mountain when God was not in the earthquake, but, but not this time. The stone is rolled away from the tomb right before their very eyes. The angel is brighter than the brightest light. His, his clothes are whiter than snow. It's the angel from the beginning of Matthew, the same one that came to Joseph to reassure him. And there's no mistake. He is not here. 
is risen. The guards are literally scared to death. In the ancient Near Eastern and even Roman culture, the meaning of an earthquake was that the gods were angry and somebody was about to be smited. Matthew describes the guards as so afraid that they appear like dead men. Perhaps they wonder if the angel has come to avenge the death of Jesus. Someone would have to pay for what's been done, and the guards fear that they're in the wrong place. I would be scared to death, too. But the angel has not come to avenge or even to continue the fight, really, at all, because we will learn that the fight against death has been won. There is no more fight. Instead, the angel of the Lord simply has a message, do not be afraid. Just like Joseph was afraid at the beginning of Matthew, that women too would have been terrified, you and I would be too. The angel proclaims, you're looking for Jesus who was crucified because you heard the last words, he died. But you see, those are not the last words at all. Not according to God. Jesus is not here. He has been raised, just as he said he would be. Come and see. This is resurrection. And resurrection is all about last words. Not our last words. Not the last words we hope never to hear, but instead, resurrection is about the last words of Almighty God, brought to us by a messenger of Almighty God, an angel who comes with a rumble and a flash. The last words on this day are to be, he lives. The futility of those that tried to kill him don't stand a chance against the last words of the creator of the universe, and he lives. And this is the power of resurrection. This is the day of resurrection. Easter is the day when we declare our greatest truth as Christians. We have nothing to fear because we trust in the last words of the Almighty. In God we trust, and thus we have hope even against the so-called last words. He died? No. He lives. You're fired? No. There is something else you're meant to do. We're bankrupt? No, only in money. But look at all the rest we have to count on. The divorce is now final. No, I will find another to love. It's incurable. There's nothing else the doctors can do. Maybe not, but God can do more. You failed your last chance. And Jesus says, there is no such thing. You see, my friends, resurrection isn't something that happens once every 2,000 years, and that's it. Resurrection is something that happens over and over and over again, and sometimes when we least expect it, with a rumble and a flash. And sometimes it comes when we don't, in quiet ways that make no sense. When we look back at our lives, go and tell others what you've seen and know to be true, he lives. I don't want to be dishonest or idealistic today. Today's not all Easter lilies and blue bonnets. Each of these last words we have named, even when overcome by resurrection, can represent hardship and suffering. At the moment we hear the struggle of death or divorce or bankruptcy and the like, we know that there will be a struggle to be endured. We cannot and should not minimize that or pray it away. Sometimes things don't happen the way we want them to. Maybe that's the reason many of us have a hard time with resurrection. Because we can't allow ourselves to admit the suffering that life sometimes brings. I found a prayer online this week sent to me by a friend of mine who's a pastor. And I wanted to just read you a couple of lines from it. God, sometimes I feel like Christ is risen is unbelievable, ungraspable, scary. And then I remember that's the point. We humans find so many things so hard to hang on to, like grace and promises and love. Easter incarnate is not an easy thing. It takes practice. It's different than hope. It's deeper, perhaps more desperate. It's community, solidarity. It's remembering Christ somehow. God walks with us. Thank you for giving us Easter, the curious story. That's why I believe that we read that the women fell at his feet, and grabbed onto them, and worshipped him. Again, in the ancient Near East, the custom to grab the feet of someone was you were beholden to. It sounds strange, but it was a it was a show of respect, prostrating oneself before someone else. It demonstrated that you had a relationship with that person, 
It also demonstrated that you had hope that they would do something for you, that you could ask them for something. These women show us in this move, in this move that they love Jesus. They had a relationship with the Lord. And they hoped that Jesus would continue to be their Lord. He was raised, overcoming death, setting the world right side up. Jesus was back to do exactly what he had come to do from the beginning. And this is our hope, our hope in resurrection. It's not an easy thing. Maybe it doesn't make sense for someone to come back from the dead. But maybe that's why it's important to believe it. Hope for better things. A better world. Could that be any more unbelievable? I don't know if you've ever noticed it before, but our sanctuary has four stained glass windows, images of Jesus, and these front ones show the feet of Jesus. The good shepherd who cares for the sheep. If you stand in front of that window, you stand literally at the feet of Jesus. The other is knock and the door will be opened. Again, stand in front of it and you stand in front of Jesus' feet. Not long ago, I, I noticed those feet. And I've developed a sort of habit. Before I preach or leave worship or, or even when I'm having a tough day, I, I come in here and I, and I gaze at the feet of Jesus. Almost like I, too, is holding on to them like the Marys did. Our sanctuary is the perfect place for this, because you can all see the feet of Jesus right now. When life gets hard and it seems as if the last words of this world will overcome us and we can stand at the feet of Jesus, we can hold on to them if needed. We can honor Jesus and worship Jesus and ask Jesus to help us with whatever we need. And we believe Jesus will have the last words. Here are some last words. When winter declares the death of the earth and all that lives, the newness of spring and Easter has the last word. When others proclaim we are nothing, unloved and unlovable, God declares that we are literally to die. When fear says nothing matters and life is meaningless, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what we can all live for. He lives. Happy Easter. Amen. Let us continue our worship now as we bring forward our tithes and our offerings.
joy. We have so much. And so we return a portion of the gifts you've given to us and ask you to bless others with these gifts so that the gospel might be known more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? If you wondered what the ruckus was when I uncovered the place, there was an Easter egg hidden inside the <laughs> Yesterday, fun. Listen to these words of invitation. People will come from north and south, east and west, and sit together at a table in the kingdom of heaven. This table does not belong to this congregation, this denomination, this church. This table belongs to all those who belong to Jesus. We encourage you. We don't just welcome you. We encourage you to participate with us today in the Lord's Supper. Listen to the words of institution as we have them from the Apostle Paul. But on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Take it and drink from it. And when you do, remember me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Would you join me in a great prayer of thanks? Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world for your promises to your people Israel and for Jesus Christ, in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. Living with you, he prays for us. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that this meal may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and all who share in this feast. Unite us in faith, encourage us with hope, inspire us to love, that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ, your word made flesh, and the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, as children of God, we pray with confidence the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
meal is prepared, let us celebrate together. Friends, the last words are not he died. The last words are he lives. This is the bread of life. Thank you.
because he lives, we are saved. This is the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. Sometimes it seems as if we live in a world of unbelievable things. And many of them are disappointing to us, sad, we're afraid. And yet you came to us, died, and was raised, so that we might continue to hold on to your feet and believe in unbelievable things, like hope and grace and peace. You have fed us once again with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us now from this place with a fresh outpouring of your spirit that we might share with others what we know to be true. He lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 118. Would you stand and sing? Thank you.